we've just released our latest summer forecast update. So Richard, in spring the forecast suggests a better growth across most of the countries in Central East and Southeast Europe. Are you still as positive? Yes, we are, and actually even more so. So in, in the spring we revised up our, our forecast for most of the region, and we've done the same again for our summer forecasts, um, so even stronger. Um, this region started the year actually very strongly, even stronger than we'd expected, especially in the EU member states. First quarter growth was at or close to multi-year highs in, in some parts of the region. And I think there are basically three reasons for this. First is the upswing that we see uh, in the Eurozone, which is very strong, and especially in Germany. Germany remains very dominant uh, in the economies of Central and Eastern Europe. It's a very significant export partner for almost all of them. And growth there is, is very strong. The first quarter growth was strong. High frequency indicators suggest the second growth, quarter growth was even stronger. And that is a very important thing, uh, thing for this region. The second factor is, is what's going on domestically. So we see quite fast employment growth, tightening labor markets, faster wage growth across most of the EU member states in Central and Eastern Europe. And that's supporting pretty good, pretty strong private consumption growth almost everywhere. The third factor is EU funds. So we saw a slowdown from this, from this uh, last year uh, to do with the, the, the gap between EU funding periods. Uh, that, that's normal. The projects for the new funding period are now, uh, are now really getting going. And so we are starting to see uh, quite a strong contribution from EU funds to growth in the region. We expect that to last. EU funds can, can be anything between two and five percentage points of GDP per year for these countries, so it's, it's very significant. But what about the countries in our region outside of the European Union? There it's a much more mixed case. I think on the positive side we have Turkey. Turkey is a very interesting story. I think at the start of this year, because of what was going on politically, people were very negative uh, about Turkey. We were never especially negative, but even we've been caught by surprise at how positive growth has been in the first half of, of this year. Um, I think after the coup attempt, uh, growth, growth was very slow. Growth actually went negative in the third quarter of last year, but since then it's bounced back very well. And basically it's coming from a lot of different factors. A big part of it is about the government. The government has fiscal room. Uh, they saved during the good years. Now they have room to spend and they're doing that. So we're seeing fiscal loosening. We're seeing quite a lot of public investment and also some government help uh, in terms of, of credit. So government providing cheaper credit to especially to small and medium sized businesses. That in turn is supporting private consumption growth, which is particularly strong. Consumer confidence is strong, but there are also external factors. One is exports, goods exports, partly helped by the weakening of the lira, but also Turkey is benefiting from this stronger demand in, in the EU, which remains Turkey's biggest export market. And the final thing is probably tourism. Uh, the tourism sector is still under pressure. Security risk is, is still perceived as being high for, for obvious reasons. Uh, but the detente with Russia last year has been very significant. Russian tourists are coming back in really big numbers. And although the tourism sector is still under pressure, overall it's stabilizing. Uh, and that is, that is a very positive thing for Turkey. The other countries uh, in our region outside of the EU are doing less well. We have quite a few growth downgrades for Russia, former Soviet Union, and some parts of the Western Balkans. Partly this is to do with political developments, uh, geopolitics, uh, the conflict in, in eastern Ukraine is still, still matters for growth. Uh, and in the Western Balkans, uh, tensions between, between countries is, is also an issue. But I think there are other factors. One is for Russia and the FSU, it's the oil price. Um, we had expected the oil price to gradually rise during our forecast period. Now we don't think it will. We think it will be flat. Uh, that's bad for the oil exporters, Russia and Kazakhstan. Uh, and in the Western Balkans, maybe one of the things holding back growth there a little bit relative to what we'd expected was, is the smaller export capacity. So these countries don't have export sectors that can compare with places like the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary. And so they're not able to take advantage of the stronger growth in Western Europe to the same extent as the Central European countries. But there is also quite some political noise around, both within the region as well as from outside. Um, You've, could you mention some countries where this political noise matters and whether it matters for the whole region? I think clearly in some countries it matters. Uh, for the, in the countries that I've already mentioned, in Russia, 
uh, Ukraine and in the Western Balkans, this political noise matters now. It, it affects the economy today. In the rest of the region, however, actually in most of the countries of the region, even where we do have a lot of political noise, so in Turkey, for example, also to a lesser extent in places like Hungary and Poland, at the moment, it doesn't seem to matter very much. And this economic upswing is clearly dominating any risks from the politics. However, we are skeptical about how much or for how long that will last. I think what we're seeing in, in some countries in the region is rising authoritarianism, the undermining of independent institutions, the challenges simply to the efficacy of institutions. And we think that has to matter. Timing when that will actually matter is difficult, but we think at some point during the forecast period that has to matter. The other issue that these countries are facing is political risks that come from outside the region. Um, an obvious one is Brexit. That's a, a big issue in, in Europe at the moment. Our calculation suggests that in value-added terms, the links between the UK and Eastern Europe in terms of goods are, are not that significant. But obviously, Brexit matters in, in, in other ways. The UK is very dominant in services. The links are extensive. And even in the goods sector, even if the overall value of exports between Eastern Europe and the UK is not that high, uh, or as a share of, of those countries' economies, such are the complexity of, of value chains in, in Europe now that if we have a, a reasonably so-called hard Brexit with the UK leaving the single market and the customs union, which still looks fairly likely, um, that will, that will have to affect these countries' uh, these countries' economies. And even taking Brexit out, there are issues within the EU. The most obvious is, is this tension that we now see between France and Poland, but it's, it's, it's a demonstration or example of, of these broader tensions between East and West Europe, which are kind of on the back burner at the moment because of Brexit, but will come back. There's a lot of irritation, I think, in Western Europe about the, the perceived lack of sharing of refugees by a lot of countries in Eastern Europe so-called free riding. Um, and if, if this escalates and if we start to see challenges to, 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 to EU funds inflows, for example, which I've already mentioned are very important, then that is an issue for, for growth in the region. So overall, do you expect that the upswing in Central, East and Southeast Europe is going to continue beyond this year? We think it will. Our forecasts are not, we haven't made such big upgrades to our forecasts for 2018 and 19 as we have done for, for this year. We do think there's a very significant cyclical component to this, which, which can't last uh, much beyond this year. What's happening in the Eurozone, we think, is very cyclical. Ultimately, not much has changed structurally. We're hearing a lot of positive noises about reform, especially uh, from the new French president, but at the moment, what we can say in structural terms is, is that not much has changed. And so we think it's, it's quite cyclical. And that matters a lot for Eastern Europe. And when that fades, if it fades next year or the year after, Eastern Europe won't be able to, to maintain these kind of growth rates. The politics is also, I think, very important. Um, as I said, it's difficult to, to predict exactly at what point these things start to matter. But they are there in the background, and they will, they will affect growth. And I would mention maybe also in particular Turkey, which growth is, is very fast at the moment, faster even than, than we expected at the start of the year. It appears to have some legs, but Turkey is vulnerable, uh, perhaps more than most of the countries uh, in the region because of its huge external deficit. It, it runs this big current account deficit, four to five percentage points of GDP per year, and it needs portfolio inflows to continue financing that deficit. And as we see this tightening of global liquidity, and the, especially because of monetary tightening in the US, and it's the US dollar rate, which is really the, the crucial one for Turkey, that's a risk. And we already see this year that, that, that net FX reserves are, are declining because Turkey can't attract enough capital inflows to finance the deficit. Uh, and if that continues and the deficit has to close, is forced to close because there isn't enough financing, that will cause the economy to slow. Thanks a lot for your explanations, Richard. Thanks for watching.